This morning we are back in chapter 1 and we'll be focusing on just two verses this morning, verses 2 and 3. But let's pick up our text from verse 1 in chapter 1 of the book of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, if you were here a month or so ago, you may remember that we have started a new teaching series in the book of James. In our first sermon, we spent the majority of our time, didn't we, looking at who the human author was of this book. And then we looked at who the recipients of this letter were. Now, in case you missed that, a quick 60-second recap to remind you that our author is James, and James is the half-brother of Jesus, and the recipients of his letter were the scattered Jewish believers spread out across all of the populated lands of the world in that day. Now, this was a letter that was designed to help in encouraging and guiding these persecuted Christians in knowing how to apply biblical truths to their own lives and within their own contexts. And as we ourselves read our Bibles today in 2023, application is so important, isn't it? I say this because when we come to the Bible, we're not reading a dusty old history book. No, we're reading the most up-to-date book that exists today because it's the only book in the world that tells us accurately what is still going to happen in the future. And we know this, don't we? That there's a vital and necessary connection between what we read in the Bible and then how we must apply what we learn to our own lives. The Bible isn't just a book of theory just to give us head knowledge. The Bible is made up of descriptive history as well as prescriptive commands that still apply to us today. And it's that application that is the focus for James. We see this a little later in his letter when he encourages his readers to be doers of the word, not just hearers. And there's a good reason for this encouragement, isn't there? We remember that this was written at a time when the the persecution of the Jewish believers, and in fact all believers, was in full swing. This persecution was designed to drive these believers out into other lands, often meaning that they left everything behind, including their belongings, their homes, their careers, as well as their friends and family. And it's with all this in mind that we pick up our text this morning, Verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Or as some translations have it, perseverance, endurance, patience. Count it all joy. Now upon hearing this, it can sound really challenging, can't it? Maybe even unrealistic. It doesn't feel natural to think about trials in this way. And that's because it's not. It's supernatural. We're not talking about a grin and bear it type attitude. No, we're talking about something so much deeper. But before we look at this, it's important that we're measuring apples against apples so that we can understand the difference in how the world and the Bible define the word joy. Now, according to one dictionary, the word joy is defined as an emotion evoked by well-being, success and good fortune or by possessing what one desires. In other words, the world sees joy as happiness, the word that is rooted in happenings or happenstance. It's an emotion based on something good happening. But when the Bible speaks about joy, We're not talking about a shallow, superficial, superficial emotional response. The Bible has a different view, which is much deeper. It's not a natural joy, but a supernatural joy. That's why in Galatians we're told that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. 
God's word teaches us us that as a, a believer's joy isn't dependent on what's happening or what we have in our life. Joy springs deep from a believer's heart. The joy that is real, permanent and secure in Christ. To truly know the Lord is to truly have joy. And it is from that unmovable truth that the believer approaches the trials of life. My hope this morning is to show us from scripture that the the true joy that exists for us as believers is not dependent on the temporary and often challenging situations that we find ourselves in. That joy isn't to be confused with the fleeting emotions of happiness and instead is something found deep within the eternal soul of the Christian believer. One of the most difficult parts of the the Christian life is the fact that becoming a follower of Christ does not make us immune to life's trials and tribulations. Now think about it, the reality is even more difficult to comprehend for the, the millions of Christians that have been introduced to the church via the prosperity gospel. The notion that it's always God's will for a Christian to be wealthy and healthy and to, to live their best life. Therefore, when you survey where we are today in the Western church in 2023, it's not built on a, on a strong foundation of enduring trials, even less so to do so understanding that these trials are are designed and purposed for the Christian's own good and for the glory of God. At times, if we're honest, it seems that we focus less on endurance and perseverance and what God is doing through the trials as we focus more on quick fixes, don't we? Our prayer lives probably reflect this. When we're going through trials of various kinds, normally I imagine our prayers are more to the tune of, Lord, will you take this trial away? Solve this problem for me, Lord, and not, Lord, help me see how you are growing me in my faith right now. And I wonder if this is because we can forget that these trials are a providence from God in having us become sanctified by the Holy Spirit. It's true, isn't it? That God refines Christian character through trials. And just one example of this is the the life of Joseph. You remember when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And then Potiphar's wife betrayed him. And and then later Pharaoh's uh, cupbearer forgot him. And yet still, in God's plan, he worked this all out to have Joseph become the second most powerful leader in Egypt. And what did Joseph later tell his brothers? What you intended to harm me, God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, enduring trials had produced in Joseph an ability to see God's greater hand in the evil intentions of his brothers. And for him to see that God had used these trials to provide Joseph with endurance, With a faith that stands. With a faith that perseveres. And this is the type of faith that we want, isn't it? And it's also the type of faith that James wanted these dispersed believers to have. That no matter what happens to them during their short time here on earth, that their faith will prove to be true and that they will endure until the end. And when we pray for our own lives to bear fruit as Christians, to make us more mature in our faith, when we ask the Lord to defeat sin in our lives or when we pray to live more holy lives, I think we often do so hoping that he will do that work whilst we go to sleep that night. Have us fall fast asleep whilst the Lord waves a magic wand over all of our hard edges, but that doesn't tend to be the way that the Lord works. It's true, isn't it, that we often learn our best lessons about ourselves when our faith is really put to the test, don't we? It's often when, this is often when God does his pruning work. There's a famous story that you may have heard involving the famous artist Michelangelo. Michelangelo. 
He was once asked about the difficulties that he faced in sculpting his masterpiece of David. And this is how he replied. He said, it's easy. You just chip away the stone that doesn't look like David. And what a picture of sanctification as God chips away at at the parts of our lives that do not look like Christ. And these trials, the chipping away can be so hard in that season, can't it? The death of a loved one, health issues, financial hardships, relationship problems, issues with housing or work. I'm sure that we could make up a list containing hundreds of the hardships that we face. But to be able to face these things with a real biblical sense of joy, knowing that the Lord is working on us, is gold, isn't it? Because the truth is that no one here today, or the original recipients of this letter, will avoid these hard things. What does our verse say? Verse 2. When you meet trials of various kinds. This is true for these dispersed believers 2,000 years ago, as it is for us today. It's a case of when we meet trials, not if. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it's on, in page 1016 in the church Bibles, if you want to go there, that's 1 Peter chapter 4. Page 1016. Verse 12. Peter writes, Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Did you see that? Do not be surprised. Every Christian will face these trials. We'll all die one day. Every single person we love will die one day. We will decline in health. We will all face huge disappointments in life. So preparation to how we will face and consider and count our trials is crucial, isn't it? Because it's not if we face these trials, but when. Now in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible clearly teaches that God loves those that are his children. And he works all things together for good. And we know that the Bible has no contradictions. So this clearly must mean that the trials and tribulations that God allows in a Christian's life are part of a working together of all things for good. Even when we can't see it, just like we heard with Joseph a few moments ago. Therefore, for the believer, all trials and tribulations must have a divine purpose. And God's ultimate purpose for us as Christians to grow more and more into the image of his son. That's the goal for every Christian, isn't it? And everything in life, including the trials and tribulations, is designed to have us reach that goal. Christian maturity. Trials designed to have us loosen our grip on this passing world and instead to have us cling on as tightly as we can to the Lord Jesus. On page 1014, if you're still in 1 Peter, in chapter 1 this time. That's 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 to 7. Peter writes in this, You greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which perishes, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have to ask the question. Who does this testing benefit? 
If you've studied God's attributes, you will know that God is omniscient. This means that God knows everything both about the past, the present and the future. God is the Alpha and Omega. God isn't like us in the way that we become wiser and more knowledgeable the more that we live. God's knowledge is already perfect and complete and it always has been. So, does a God that is perfectly knowledgeable... A God that can read your heart and hear your thoughts. And a a God that knows every single thing that you have done and will do in the future. Does a God like that need to test your faith for his benefit or for yours? Does the God that actually gives that faith in the first place, the author and finisher of our faith, does he need to check if one of his own is actually born again for his benefit? Oh, of course not. This is a grace designed to set apart believers from the world. It's a grace designed to develop an endurance until the end, strengthening the true believer in assurance. One Puritan commentary that I've read over the last few weeks points out that the old English word for test was to prove. These trials, the tests, the proving help expose a man's heart And it's from our hearts that these trials are born. In James chapter 1 verse 13 we read, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Temptation or testing in the bad sense always proceeds from the malice of Satan, working on the corruptions of our own heart. And Romans chapter 1 develops this idea, doesn't it? The unregenerate man is simply given over to his own sinful lusts that are already present and running wild. So how does this fit with our passage in this letter being sent to the dispersed believers? Well, sometimes God allows his children into circumstances of testing through trials. He does this in order to truly show an individual the the true disposition of their heart and to bring them to full Christian maturity. Now I know it's certainly true in my own life that when I am under the most pressure, that my true colours seem to come to the surface and it's in that refining fire that the Lord does his work. And a pastoral concern for James as he wrote this epistle would have been that these dispersed believers could be taken in by their new surroundings and tempted to turn their back on God. It'd be so easy, wouldn't it? Surrounded by these new cultures, new friends and neighbours worshipping all sorts of made-up false gods. And how many times have we already seen in scripture where the the Jews, after a period of time, took foreign wives and ended up worshipping these false gods. One purpose of this letter was to remind these Jewish believers what it meant to be a Christian. And this is so important for us to remember as well, isn't it? Some of you, maybe many of you are facing trials that feel weighty and at times even unbearable. But how reassuring for us to know that the Lord is sovereign That there is a purpose behind the hardships that we face and that it isn't just down to random bad luck. But instead, if you are in Christ, this is a pruning work. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 we read, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It's why the Apostle Paul can write, In all of our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. Paul, in his worst state, felt an exuberance of joy. In another passage, he goes further still. He says that we rejoice in our sufferings. And outside of Christ, this sounds so counterintuitive, doesn't it? But we know, don't we, that how one person views a situation can be quite different from another. 
The way that a Christian views something should be quite different to how the world sees it. In fact, I've learned how people view things differently in quite a practical way in recent years. If you know my wife Elizabeth, you may already know that her favourite shop in the whole world is the dump shop at the Eastbourne Recycling Centre. This is quite literally a shop made up of things that the, the workers have pulled out of the bins and the skips that people have tried to throw away. One person viewed something as rubbish, and yet another person, Elizabeth, views it as treasure. The trials are sweet or bitter, depending on how we view them. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, Paul says in 2 Corinthians. And this isn't an experience just reserved for the apostle. No, this may and should be the motto for all of us as Christians. The book of James intends to be an encouragement to us all. Every Christian here this morning and for those watching online. That regardless of our external experience, it's possible for our heart to be at peace and sing, it is well with my soul. This is so against how our flesh longs to work that this would be impossible apart from the grace of God. It's of course the Holy Spirit that equips the believer to stay standing during these seasons. As an example, picture the, the personal trainer in the gym. As they encourage you through those last few painful reps. When your arms are shaking, everything hurts, but it's in those moments that the body is building muscle and becoming stronger. This mindset is a gift from God. The Lord gives an outpouring of grace for his children under trials and to receive this. One must run to Christ, the giver of this gift, and not away from him during these trying times. And that in itself can be a test, can't it? In Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul tells his readers that they, re they receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the tendency when we face trials is to withdraw, to begin to look inwards and engage with our own feelings as we begin to feel sorry for ourselves. But what happens in that moment is that we, we take our eyes off of Christ and squarely on us. Maybe at that moment we begin to seek worldly counsel rather than come to the Lord in prayer and to meditate on his word. I'm sure that we've all had these seasons. All of a sudden coming to church feels like a chore. In our minds we can begin to make excuses and, and justify our absence. We can't find the words to pray so we don't bother saying anything at all. Our Bible reading at home becomes stale and all of a sudden it feels like that the Lord has run a million miles away from us. But in truth, we know that he hasn't moved an inch. You don't need me to tell you that it's not good for us to think or act in this way. How foolish it would be for us to find ourselves at sea in the middle of a storm, sat on a lifeboat and yet feel it best to throw ourselves overboard into the fierce ocean. It's us that find ourselves bent away from him. It's us that at, at times we find ourselves running in the opposite direction and yet he remains patiently and tenderly waiting, arms open wide. And it's in the middle of these trials that we find our faith tested. Do we run to him or do we run away? Now this isn't a case of pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. A case of having to have a word with ourselves. No, this is about knowing the source of all strength and joy. The Lord Jesus Christ. You may have heard the saying that someone can be too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. But I truly believe that that's the worst advice ever. The opposite is true, isn't it? This temporary earth is not our home. We are passing by. We're sojourners, aliens, foreigners to this world. 
Let's not get too comfortable in the things that fade away. Instead, be so heavenly minded that we can be of some earthly good. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, the second point I hope to make is that it would be wise for us briefly to speak about the difference between trials and the consequences of our sin brought upon ourselves. As we've seen, trials are for a purpose and can be sudden and involuntary, but totally for our good and for the glory of God. But there are also pains in this life that are due to sin and bad choices. We know too well, don't we, that our sins can catch up with us at a later date. To illustrate this, maybe you've had experience a time in your life when you've told a lie. Maybe you've justified it in your mind by thinking, well, it's only a little lie. A little lie which then snowballs into many more lies at a later date to cover through this first lie. And then, at some later date, the shame as it's exposed. Our sinful actions can and often will bear consequences in our lives. Another example, if you were to fill up your car with petrol on the way home this morning and drive off without paying, then when the police catch up with you and arrest you for theft, you'll discern for yourself that this may not be a a trial, but a consequence of a bad decision and that of a sin having stolen the petrol. Trials are different to sinful consequence. Christ has taught, hasn't he, to pray, lead us not into temptation. It's only foolish pride that that flirts with temptation, thinking that we can get close to the flames and not get burnt. In 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 15, we read that we, we gain no strength from our sufferings when there's guilt in them. Peter writes, let none of you suffer as a as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. I remember recently speaking with a street preacher who wore the persecution that he received as a badge of honour. It wasn't until I got to know him a bit better that I realised that actually much of the comments he received and the arguments that he got into was not actually persecution at all. He was just really argumentative and was actually guilty of being quite rude to people walking past. As Christians, we do not need to go looking for these trials. God is a faithful teacher, for the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Now another ditch that we need to avoid is to think that a certain trial is an evidence of God's anger against us. As John Murray has helpfully written, he says, God is not like us. His ways are not like us. In our lives, we make plans beforehand, but we do not know if they are going to happen or how they will play out. But God has planned everything for his creation. And because he is the sovereign God of the universe, everything will come to pass as he purposed at the appointed time. Providence is the the working of God by which all the events and happenings in his universe accomplish the purpose of his will. His plans are secret and they are perfect. They are exhaustive and if you are a Christian, then they are for your ultimate good and for his perfect glory. It's impossible, isn't it, for us to discern God's motive in a certain situation. And it can be extremely dangerous for us to start speculating. Just think about the book of Job. It's so important that it's the Bible that informs our understanding of these things. Because there's nothing like a trial to to hold a mirror up to ourselves to test the authenticity of our faith. For it's the same sunshine that melts the ice, but also hardens the clay. Trials and afflictions refine some, and they consume others. If you remember the parable of the sower, there is a a soil that of the false convert that that shoots up enthusiastically and looks like it's going to blossom into a true Christian. But what happens? When the trial comes, they fell away. 
Perseverance means that true faith will last until the end. And it's true, isn't it, that trials teach the Christian lessons that we cannot learn from reading a book or from listening to sermons. It's one thing to know about God, but it's another thing to know God and be known by God. Have you not learned more through the furnace of affliction than you have through seasons of peace? I know I have. I can look back at some of the most difficult things that I've faced in my life and can see how God has used it. Friends, how desperately we need the Lord. Not only for our everyday needs to sustain us in staying alive on this planet right now, but also for his work on the cross. For him to have taken the punishment of a Christian's sin upon himself. What a God we have. If we lived for nothing but a life of comfort and ease, then there would be no desire for the blessings to come in eternity. In this way, God prepares Christians for glory. Faith is not simply a matter of words or what a professor looks like on the outside. It's a matter of the heart. And trials put faith in the refining fire. And pure faith always emerges out of the furnace, brighter and stronger. And as we draw to a close, if you're with us this morning and you're not a Christian, it's important to know that any trials that you experience in your life could be the greatest gift that you ever receive. If it's a trial that leads you to be humbled, If it's a hardship that confronts you with the depravity of your own sin and if the Lord uses this for you to to come to know of your great need in coming to Christ in repentance and faith, then you will come to rejoice in these hardships. There's nowhere more dangerous than for someone to be content in their life and outside of Christ. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? And to forfeit his own soul. And finally, the goal for the Christian is that we should become more and more like our Saviour. The whole of Christ's character is to be reproduced in us. When God is at work in a believer, he, he first inspires that faith. He then perfects that faith through sanctification. As we said, Christian maturity is the the goal for all believers and we are to think about trials in the light of what God is achieving in us through those trials. And just as the world has to pass through winter before the spring comes and the flowers bloom, so a Christian must go through many trials before he or she inherit the prize of eternal life. And just as Paul said, Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And that is the source of everlasting joy. Let's pray.